Welcome to the November 3rd, 2021 meeting of the Town of Southampton Conservation Board. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with Chapter 417 of the laws of 2021, until January 15th, 2022, all of the board's meetings are expected to be held remotely via video conference. We ask the public to continually check the town's website for updates and new information. As a reminder, applicants, agents, and members of the public who speak at this meeting should state their name and address for the record. The link to participate in this meeting via Zoom can be found on the town's website at the town clerk's meeting portal. If you do not wish to speak at the meeting, but you would like to submit comments for the public record, the link to submit comments can also be found on the town's website. Please join together for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. all. We, um, we have the October 27th meeting minutes that can be approved. Is there a motion to approve? Roll call? Uh, yes, roll call. Harry? George? Here. Ann? Here. Tom Rickenback? Tom Rickenback present. Jerry? Jerry here. Now, what is your pleasure on the minutes of October 27th? I was not present, so I'm abstaining. Motion to accept. Motion to accept as written or amended. Second. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Aye. Tom? I abstain. And Jerry? Jerry here. Now we have before us the resolution to schedule the 2022 Conservation Board meeting dates. And it's been brought to my attention, attention that they need to be adjusted to reflect the first and third Wednesdays of November and December. And with that change, is our motion to approve? Motion to accept with those changes. Is it moved and a second? And Second. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Public hearings A021026, Thomas Conti. Is there someone here in the public for this application? I'll have to raise their hand. I don't see anyone. We uh, should have Bruce Anderson or Mike Walsh or Robert Anderson. No, not here. And has, it been, has it been opened at all? It's it been opened, but not heard. We have, we have jurisdiction? Yes. Okay. So why don't I we- I bet they for forgot now. it was first and third also. Well, they requested this date. Okay. Let's um, put that aside for now and go to the next one. And we can come back to that and give them time to get on board if they need a little more time. Uh, so zero, A021056, 43 Kite Surfer LLC. This is a new hearing and we do have affidavits of posting and mailing. They are in compliance with the town code. So we can open the hearing tonight. Thank you. And we should have somebody in the audience for this. Um, yep. Um, okay, they're on the way. Hi. Hello, Nika. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Aram Turchuni in First Coastal Corporation, West Hampton Beach, New York. Aram's going to go first. I'm Nika Strunk, 37 Windmill Lane, Southampton, New York. Also for the same project. Good 
Okay, Aaron, go ahead. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you for uh, hearing us tonight. And um, this is a uh, project on East Shore Road in North Sea. Um, it is a uh, cobble covered rock revetment intended to uh, preserve a buffer zone and property located at 43 East Shore Road. And um, you have uh, in the file a uh, preliminary uh, report from Marty Shea. And um, I delivered to you today um, a response to that report. And as I indicated in my email, uh, my objective tonight is just to give you a high level overview of what we're doing, um, uh, field any questions that come to mind as we're talking about it, and then uh, give you the chance, you know, the opportunity to digest it and perhaps give me more detailed questions um, as we proceed. Uh, a little more. A bit of background built pursuant to a conservation board permit. It crashed. What's that? I think okay, I'm not hearing anybody. I'm trying to get him back in. Okay. He's on. I don't know. Okay. Hi, I'm back. My system crashed several times, but seems to have recovered. Okay. Not completely. There you go. Need more mice on that treadmill there. Mm. Are you still having a problem? Aram's picture looks frozen. I don't see him moving. Well, something must be wrong because I've never heard him this quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I'll quote Moonstruck, someone tell a joke. I'm sure he's going to try to get back on here in a second. Ah. So I am going to stop the screen share. a second, just to make sure I can get him in. I texted him. Okay, he was in the whole time, too, from the beginning. Hi, good evening. Aram Tertunian here. I apologize. I don't know what happened, but I had to reboot my system and hopefully it shook out all the bugs. Uh, I'll just proceed ahead if that's okay with the, uh, with the board. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Okay, uh, Karina, thank you for putting up the survey of the property. Um, as I was saying, this house was uh, constructed on the site pursuant to conservation board permit and uh, a non-fertilization, non-disturbance buffer zone was uh, uh, established as you see on the survey. Um, the site began to experience erosion in the latter part of the 2018-2019. Uh, in 2020, First Coastal applied for and received the permit. Actually, we didn't apply for it. Uh, it was uh, applied for by somebody else. We then, uh, that permit was um, initially for a rock revetment covered with sand. Uh, staff requested that that be changed to a gravel and sand berm mix. Uh, that project was constructed in, um, uh, I think it was September. September or October of 2020. Um, it might have been in the spring. It was, it was constructed in 2020. The permit was issued in January. The project was constructed, I believe, that spring. By October, that a project had been completely eroded. And by uh, December of 2020, the, uh, the project had, um, uh, the property had experienced even uh, more significant erosion. Uh, removing entirely uh, the constructed um, gravel and sand dune and further eroding the upland. What um, that, that uh, caused the applicant to refile a permit uh, with the conservation board to establish a, um, a revetment. And in this case, the revetment would be covered with cobblestone that's compatible with the stone that's on the beach right now. Um, Staff uh, provided uh, their preliminary report, um, uh, made a number of comments, asked us to do an alternative analysis. In response to that, we did repair, prepare an alternative analysis, which was forwarded to you today. Again, I didn't expect you to read the 20 pages, um, but I did want to take uh, this evening just the opportunity to walk through it and, um, and then get some, some feedback from you. And, um, uh, and, and go from there. So uh, Karina, may I share my screen please? Or Charles? Yes, sir. Okay, so I uh, will assume that everyone uh, is seeing my screen now. Not yet, it's blank. You have to choose what you want to share. He's frozen again. I think his computer ran out of memory, and I think that's what the situation is. Gravigen. Wow. It's back again. Uh, okay, yeah. I'm back again. I don't know what the issue is, but um, I will try to persevere. There it is. Thank you for your patience. Uh, this is the uh, picture of the site from the beach in uh, December of 2020, just prior to us preparing and submitting our application to the board. Um, this executive summary, if you go through it, um, hopefully does what it's intended to do, which is to lay out um, our proposal, the alternatives, and the reasons why we selected uh, the alternative of a cobble, cobble covered revetment. Um, just for a little bit of location, uh, this is a subject property on East Shore Road. There is a community parcel just to the south of it here that um, uh, is undeveloped. Uh, there's a series of properties um, adjacent to it uh, right here that both have revetments approved by the board. There's a retaining wall here 
um, another revetment north of that, and then north of that, about a, a thousand or more feet of um, various types of seawalls. Uh, the area is uh, in a, a VE elevation eight flood zone on the shoreline, and then the backside of the property is in an AE uh, flood zone. This is just a very uh, brief overview of the uh, permit history that I described to you earlier um, and the uh, a plan view of the location of the revetment here parallel to Little Peconic Bay shoreline and a cross-sectional view. Uh, th these are in more detail in the original application in your files. Carol, could I interrupt you, please? Yes. On that <clears throat> cross view, what do you have in the front, you see where it says cobble fill? Yes. What's holding that up? What's holding that together? Um, there, there's filter cloth underlying the entire structure. So, um, so the, the, we would excavate into the, into the beach, lay the filter cloth down, put down the toe stones at the bottom of that, uh, wrap the filter cloth around that, and then the, um, there would be a secondary layer of filter cloth enca encapsulating um, the cobble. But we, you know, that won't come up to the surface because we expect that cobble to mix right into the beach. So okay. we, don't, we don't mind if it mixes. All right, thank you. Um, and so the, um, in this note down here, you'll see that um, you know, the primary difference here is that we've changed the composition of the material that we're gonna use. And uh, this becomes important later on uh, because you know, we're going to a, um, a, um, a cobble sand ratio of 75-25 versus what has been done in the past, which was a 25-75 uh, gravel, gravel or cobble to sand. So this is um, considerably heavier material. Um, this is the same photo on the front, but with some explanations. Um, I thought it was useful to call out the various things that we're seeing. Uh, it's important to note here that th there was a very extensive root system, as you see in this photo, and it just can't stand up to the wave attack. Um, you know, sand and vegetation alone is, is not going to do the job. You can see here in the dark layer, so the sand is the light layer on top. And then this dark layer beneath, this is the actual headland that's being eroded. You can see chunks of it lying out on the beach. And you can see that the beach is quite low and narrow and that there is a very heavy gravelly cobbly component to the beach itself. Um, we wanted to characterize uh, the conditions of the site. Um, we've done that in a couple of different ways. Um, these are, this is a photograph uh, taken from a video in, uh, in March of 2018. Um, and for those of you who spend time on Peconic Bay, you know, it is a beautiful, lovely place, especially in the spring, summer. But come fall and winter, you can get these three plus foot waves that strike the shoreline about every four seconds. Um, and so this is the type of condition that we're attempting to um, defend against. Uh, in a in a uh, in a flexible manner, that is described uh, through a number of um, scientific and engineering publications, such as the FEMA flood insurance study, the Hurricane Sandy flood event viewer, and also looking at projected sea level rise vis-a-vis uh, -vis the New York State regulations. Um, when we pull apart the FEMA uh, information. What that shows you here is that um, in a 100 year storm, the combined still water and wave height generates about 8.4 feet of surge above the normal, sur normal sea level. 5.5 um, feet of that is what we call the still water component. So uh, when, you know, when the waves strike the shoreline, they tend to rush up on the shoreline and that adds of just about three feet of additional storm surge. But on the back bay area, where, where there aren't any waves, you get a still water elevation of about 5.5 feet. Uh, importantly, Sandy actually had a, a still water surge elevation of 6.5 feet, actually exceeded the 100 year storm as predicted at this location. There are some notes down here that describe 
uh, the different data we're using, uh, the standard data we're using, and the description of the storm surge as I just described. This is the Hurricane Sandy viewer. You can see that these were gauges that were established by the United States Geological Survey uh, just prior to Sandy. And then you can see that uh, this is the elevation of 6.5. You can see that the quality is excellent, plus or minus 0 0.05 feet. Um, and uh, that location is very close to, uh, to our project site, um, you know, literally uh, within a half a mile. Um, we then looked at the erosion history of the site, um, and, and it's recently just gone a dramatic uh, change in, in the shoreline. Here in April of 2016, uh, from the average shoreline, uh, it was 47 feet. And then by 2020, it's down to 18 feet. And this is seven feet a year. And that's really startling. I mean, that's an alarming shoreline erosion rate. And you could see that in the photograph uh, that I showed you what the result is. And I will go into a little more detail right here. So this is what the area looked like in 2019. There was this nice vegetated buffer. Um, there was uh, a, a, a decent beach. Uh, you can see there is some minor erosion at the toe of this, and that's what prompted the original application in 2020. Um, but then that project was completed, but then by, uh, uh, I think this photo is, I want to say this photo is October of 2020, the, the, uh, the restored uh, dune is almost completely gone. Here you can see again, the very heavy nature of this beach. It's not a sandy beach when the storm comes. It's really very heavy material. And you can just start to see peeking out here, the, the dark area where that is the upland actually being eroded. So here you have a project constructed, you know, mere months ago and almost all of it is gone. And the upland itself is being additionally eroded. And then you get to this condition, which is what we described so what, what I described earlier, and you can see how much dramatically worse it got in, in literally less than a year. Um, the other thing that we looked at in our analysis was looking at sea level rise. The DEC wants us to incorporate sea level rise into um, our, uh, our work, uh, into the permit uh, decisions and the design. And we typically use the 2050 medium sea level rise of about 16 inches. And that you know, gives us what we believe to be a reasonable uh, approximation uh, for what sea level is intended to be in 2050s. Um, when we summarize all this information, what we end up with is uh, this table here. You have an erosion rate that's extremely high, seven feet per year. You have a sea level rise that's very high. Um, at 0.4 inches per year. You have a tide range of one and a half to four feet is moderate. Your storm surge is greater than three. That's considered high. Waves high. And the fetch is five miles. A fetch, of course, being the distance across water that wind blows to generate waves um, uh, is also high. So you have a high energy environment. The purpose of this table is just to quantify that, hey, we're dealing with a high energy environment. Um, we then went into our uh, alternative analysis and we, we evaluated 10 different um, alternatives, including the ones that uh, Marty pointed out in his preliminary report. The, um, and also I should say that one of the things that, that Marty uh, requested that uh, we demonstrate um, in his preliminary report was, um, is there erosion at the site? And, and I would submit to the board based upon the information we've provided that is clear there is erosion at the site. In any case, if we walk through these alternatives quickly, vegetation alone is clearly not going to work. You have the evidence uh, for that that I've shown you. Similarly, sand and vegetation uh, is suffering the same fate. Um, a revetment alone will work at this site, and I just simply said it, it's effective at controlling upland erosion, but it, uh, it is not um, without uh, some type of mitigation. Uh, the revetment alone is uh, not considered to be uh, compatible. Um, then the other alternative is, well, how do you mitigate that revetment? Do you mitigate it with sand? Sorry, I'm jumping around. 
uh, do you mitigate that with sand? And what we've seen is that sand is just going to get washed away immediately. Um, this board issued right in the neighborhood these four permits for sand covered revetment. Um, and sand was placed on them and sand has been washed away. The other uh, alternative that was brought up was a cobble berm. And, you know, a cobble berm can be very effective, but the problem is we're dealing with 80 feet of shoreline. And in order for a cobble berm to be effective, it's a lot like beach nourishment. You have to have, you know, on the Peconic Bay, you've got to have about a thousand feet of shoreline. So really don't have the opportunity to, to apply a cobble berm by itself here because we don't have a long enough stretch of shoreline. Um, and that's, um, we'll get back to that in a second. The, 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 we'll get back to the benefits of cobble in a moment. But the other, next alternative that was requested to be examined was a breakwater or living shoreline. And just so that um, the board understands what these look like, you know, we just finished building a six property um, a segmented offshore breakwater living shoreline. This is on Mauritius Bay in West Hampton Beach in West Hampton, I'm sorry. And you can see it consists of these offshore breakwaters, um, graded material behind it. And then um, back in this area is a rock revetment that gets covered with sand and planted. But this is you know, a very established compartment with a bulkhead on, on each end of it. So that's not on a wide open beach, it's on this very compartmentalized pocket beach and um, if you look at an aerial view, you can see that this is what they look like. These are functioning extremely well, um, and we build them. Uh, we build them when it's appropriate. The problem is it's simply not appropriate on this site. You can't treat a single parcel with this method. Um, you can see that this compartment is highly confined here on the upper right-hand side by a pre-existing bulkhead, and then we built this uh, segmented offshore breakwater into, uh, into the, the shoreline and creating these nice uh, stable crescent beaches behind it. So it's a wonderful technique. It simply can't work on a single parcel of land. Um, the other thing we were asked to look at was a staggered boulder field. This is something that's been done on Robbins Island and Cow's Neck. Um, again, we have, um, we have a couple of uh, disadvantages. It takes a long stretch of shoreline doing 80 feet of shoreline is not really gonna be effective. Second, they, they have a huge footprint on the beach. So um, not only are you gonna limit vehicular traffic, you're gonna inhibit pedestrian traffic because you know, <coughs> you know, if you think about it, the, you know, in order for any a protective device to work, it has to stop the water from striking the land. Well, if it's porous and these and these staggered rocks are placed far apart, the water is just going to rush in between them. So you have to pack them so densely that um, that they that they slow down or stop the waves and water from coming. And on this very small site, it's simply uh, not. Uh, we don't believe that that is a reasonable will get a reasonable performance and it has a lot of, uh, we believe negative effects as I've described. The other idea we were asked to review was a regional beach recovery where we would do structure removal and beach restoration. And you know, as this board knows and supported, the North Sea Beach Colony project was, was one of those regional beach management projects where we had 1,200 feet of beach. We had willing. Uh, we had a, an association. They formed an erosion control district, and that project work is working extremely well. Well, we simply don't have those uh, elements on this site. What we have is an 80-foot parcel that we have to deal with those constraints. Um, another alternative was the retaining wall, and again, a retaining wall will control erosion on the upland, but it doesn't satisfy some of our other desires for a more flexible and, and uh, um, responsive structure. So we come back to uh, what it is that we originally proposed, which is the cobble covered revetment. Now, what's the purpose of that? Uh, the purpose is that number one, that we need to have a very high level of predictable protection for the upland. We, we know what the uh, erosion is occurring. We know what the waves are striking the shoreline and that structure has to be able to survive those conditions. At the other hand, we want to soften the edge of that structure as much as possible by, by putting in material that's compatible with the beach, but is heavy enough that it's not just going to be washed away in the first storm. 
And that's what what leads us to cobble, which is material that is, you know, up to 18 inches in diameter. It ranges anywhere from five inches to 10 inches to 18 inches. And it's a mixed bag. And the whole purpose of that is that um, it, it has a range of mixtures. It's not one uniform size. And the beauty of these uh, cobble, uh, of, of using the cobble is we get to combine the, the best aspects of both of these uh, techniques. Cobble alone is, is not gonna function properly. And a revetment alone is not going to uh, provide the flexible benefits that uh, this board is looking for. And that will, uh, that will be most compatible with the beach. But by combining these two together, uh, we get the protection level necessary and the flexibility on the beach necessary. So we believe that on balance, this is the most practicable uh, way to address the problem. I, won't, I will totally not bore you with uh, my walk through the code. Uh, that's there for you to read, but essentially uh, I address every aspect of 325-9 uh, uh, as to how this meets the standards for permit issuance. And um, I hope that you will agree with me that it does. And uh, I'll point out um, as, as at the bottom of the executive summary, and as you see here at the bottom of this page, uh, recently, um, Marty was communicating with one of the property owners to the north of here who had a sand covered revetment permit and placed the sand. And in going back and reviewing uh, what to do uh, to better retrofit the project, it's Marty's recommendation that this be a, a 75-25 cobble sand mix as what you go over it. And that's what we're proposing here. So um, that really concludes what I have to say, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have now and, and come back again uh, and speak with the board uh, at, at your earliest convenience. Thank you, Aram. If there are no questions for Aram, I'd just like to say very few words as uh, the applicant's attorney. Um, obviously, I think that the, the technical presentation here shows the need for the application to be granted. Um, the, there are four other properties directly to the northeast of this property that received approvals within the last few years for essentially comparable projects under comparable circumstances. Um, and as a matter of precedent, I, I think that, that you know, those, those decisions are, there wouldn't be any reason to distinguish this property from the, those properties that received those approvals. And that's an additional reason for this board to grant the application. Thanks. Thank you, Nika. Um, Marty. Yeah, good evening. I'm Marty Shea, Chief Environmental Analyst for the uh, town. As uh, indicated, there is a uh, preliminary advisory report on file dated uh, September 21, 2021. Um, as indicated, I only uh, received uh, Aram's 20 page uh, report at uh, 1.25 this afternoon. So I will uh, need additional time after tonight in order to uh, better uh, evaluate the uh, findings of his report. Uh, that being said, the conditions of this uh, property uh, are somewhat uh, different uh, from uh, some of the other uh, properties where um, uh, rock uh, armor and uh, revetments were uh, authorized in that um, south, immediately uh, southwest of this uh, property, you have uh, unarmed uh, natural uh, beach uh, you have a uh, private uh, community uh, association uh, beach uh, access area abutting the uh, subject uh, lot. Um, and then you have uh, homes uh, southwest of there where you have uh, sand and cobble 
and uh, generally a lack of uh, armor. Uh, one of the uh, concerns um, is that if uh, we continue uh, with the uh, same uh, type of uh, rock armor, uh, that um, uh, shoreline uh, hardening uh, may uh, impact the uh, natural uh, beaches to the uh, southwest of this uh, property. Um, as uh, the applicant uh, knows, uh, we uh, were faced with uh, some of the other properties with um, uh, significant erosion uh, that may have uh, been uh, partly uh, related to a uh, court ordered uh, concrete wall on the beach um, that uh, did not uh, receive uh, conservation board uh, permits. Uh, there was uh, significant uh, concern among uh, some of the landowners that we issued uh, permits to that the uh, presence of that wall was um, uh, complicating uh, the beach uh, dynamics and uh, perhaps uh, resulting in additional erosion. The uh, properties to the north of the site with the uh, concrete uh, wall um, are uh, the two lots where uh, we issued uh, permits for rock uh, were positioned between the uh, concrete wall and um, bulkheads to the uh, north. So they were kind of uh, caught uh, between uh, two areas of uh, shore uh, armoring where opportunities for managing the shoreline uh, differently uh, can be uh, somewhat uh, problematic uh, because the adjacent uh, uh, armor and shore hardening. Uh, just south southwest of the uh, property with the uh, concrete wall, uh, the intent of that uh, project initially was to have uh, randomly uh, placed uh, rock along the uh, shoreline. Um, that was the uh, consensus at the uh, hearing. Uh, but unfortunately, when that rock got placed, um, it, it got placed in the manner of which you would construct more of a uh, vertical uh, uh, revetment or rock almond wall. Uh, thereby uh, raising a heightened uh, concern with uh, regards to properties to the immediate uh, south southwest of that. So, as uh, indicated, um, there were um, there was an additional uh, rock uh, armed uh, upper beach that was uh, authorized. And now we're experiencing um, um, erosion on the uh, subject uh, property. Uh, there, you know, obviously during the uh, winter and summer uh, months, there are some uh, differences in the beach width at this property. Um, you would anticipate during the fall and winter uh, months, as uh, spoken to by the applicant. Uh, that you're going to get more uh, significant uh, storms and erosion uh, during that period. Um, and then uh, typically during the uh, summer meet, uh, months, the uh, beach uh, widens. I only mention that because the natural uh, dynamics of these uh, beaches and uh, shorelines have, has to be uh, factored into any uh, plan for uh, management of that beach. Um, typically in situations like this, um, where we uh, see the likely need for uh, some boulders and uh, cobble to uh, shore up the eroding uh, embankment on the uh, beach, uh, we look for the uh, quantity and size of those boulders to be reduced um, and to uh, descend uh, further in the uh, ground as the uh, line of boulders uh, continues uh, south towards the uh, unarmed uh, beaches. 
uh, the, um, you know, obviously the um, uh, placement of considerable rock on these uh, beaches changes the ecology of the uh, area. In some cases, it can actually increase uh, the erosion rates uh, when that rock is exposed due to the uh, deflection of wave, the wave action downward on the beach. Um, there, it can also have an impact at the uh, tail end of the armor if the adjacent beaches are unarmored and can uh, increase the erosion rate on those uh, beaches. So um, I think uh, one of the options uh, that the applicant needs to look at is uh, reducing the uh, quantity of uh, boulders um, along that shoreline um, going uh, south, uh, southwest and also look to uh, uh, set those boulders deeper in the ground uh, as you go uh, south, uh, southwest. So where the property uh, abuts on an armored uh, beach, um, there's less uh, likelihood of uh, significant um, exposure of that rock uh, during the uh, winter periods. And there's also um, a reduced uh, likelihood of the armor on the subject property causing um, erosion of the beach uh, downward of this uh, site. What we're, we're trying to avoid here is while I recognize the desire of these uh, landowners um, to uh, defend the, uh, the erosion line and um, to do whatever they can to try and lessen uh, storm impacts on those uh, properties. Uh, we need to uh, consider the uh, larger uh, area and uh, give uh, additional thought to whether or not uh, the um, Rock armor that's proposed uh, could be placed in a way where it is unlikely to uh, result in uh, significant erosion just to the uh, south. Um, what, what I'd uh, like to do um, now that uh, we uh, received in a, um, a report from the applicant is take the time to uh, revisit the uh, property, uh, look at the dynamics, what are, what's occurring right, uh, right now, um, and then I'll be in a better uh, position to uh, make additional uh, recommendations at the uh, next uh, meeting. So, um, you know, I thank the uh, applicant for uh, taking the uh, time to evaluate a host of options. Uh, for this uh, site. I look forward to uh, reviewing the uh, report in uh, detail and uh, communicating uh, further uh, with the uh, applicant with uh, regards to whether or not it makes sense to entertain, entertain some uh, design uh, modifications to uh, try to uh, prevent uh, these uh, boulders from uh, impacting the uh, unarmed uh, beaches to the uh, south. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Aram, I see your name, but not a picture. Are you, are you still on board here? Um, I'm trying. Okay. If you can hear me, I'm trying. <laughs> I can I can hear you. All right. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, we welcome the dialogue uh, with Marty and with the board to design a project that satisfies um, the, and the standards in the code. So okay. um, if the board has any questions, you know, from, from what we've uh, delivered tonight, uh, uh, fire away. I'll do my best to answer them. Otherwise, I would request that you schedule us at your next available meeting. Give Marty and I uh, an opportunity to knock this around and see what we come up with. I do have a question, Aaron. Uh, you had some rather graphic pictures, uh, very descriptive pictures of the uh, erosion, of the wave action, of the effects of the erosion, and of the before and after, essentially, and even during. Uh, 
but you also spoke about the timing of those activities, those uh, the wave action, and it's all in the last two to three years. And yet that house looks like it's been there for quite a while and the beach longer than that. Can you point to any event or any uh, reason why this uh, high level of erosion has occurred just in the last couple of years and not earlier? I don't even see Aaron's picture anymore. Oh, he's coming Aaron's back. Coming back. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I, the last thing I heard was uh, photos of before, after, and during storms. Okay. My question is, uh, can you point to a reason why this erosion seems to have occurred primarily in the last two or three years, uh, as opposed to earlier than that? when it looks like that house has been there for quite a while, can you point to an event or a situation that initiated that or why this change is occurring? Um, I, I can't point to an event, but, uh, you know, typically, uh, you know, if, if, if you notice from the, um, uh, from the, the Sandy map, uh, this property is in, um, you know, uh, within a short distance of an existing inlet that gets dredged periodically. And uh, sediment management at these inlets is critical. Uh, we haven't really looked into the sediment budget at the inlet, but my suspicion is that, um, you know, uh, the sediment management that takes place is usually driven by the efficiency of the dredging as opposed to the needs of uh, the sediment budget to nourish the system. It's my suspicion that, you know, better sediment management here would go a long way. This is exactly what happened at North Sea Harbor Inlet. The, the problem is that that's a process uh, that this board knows takes years. I mean, we spent three and a half years to straighten out the North Sea Harbor uh, inlet situation. And, and we're going to have to, you know, be ever vigilant going forward to make sure it doesn't uh, unwind itself. So, I, you know, when that's, so that, that's, you know, my suspicion. I don't, I haven't done the analysis to give you the direct answer. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, certainly I don't know whose responsibility it is to address, but I think it would be beneficial to the shoreline to have it addressed. It seems to me that addressing that could allow for um, additional sediment to be placed on this property. But when we talk about losing seven feet a year, that's a lot of space. That's a lot of erosion. Well, what happens on these systems um, is that um, uh, they reach a breaking point. So they will erode uh, very slowly over time as the amount of sand in the system is slowly reduced. But once they get to a tipping point, they then erode very quickly. And I suspect that's what's happened here is that after, you know, many decades of, of slow erosion, the, the balance of, of, uh, uh, of sand in the beach reached a critical mass below which um, it, you know, the, the erosion accelerated. And I've seen that in, in many situations. I always say beaches are like bank accounts. You know, once you get to a critical level, even a small withdrawal causes you to overdraw. Okay. Uh, my thinking, of course, is that uh, you're talking about doing something on this property when I'm thinking, what's the macro thing going on here? What are the dynamics that are making this happen? Uh, would you say that that erosion then, uh, we see the erosion right along the shore and you see the, the beach becoming narrow, but would you say that there is also erosion that's unseen under the under the water itself, which then has the effect of causing the waves to be bigger. Yeah, that's that is in fact um, uh, the way it occurs. You know, beaches are like icebergs. Ninety percent of the beach is under the water, 
And what you see in the dry, what we call the dry beach or the visible beach is only 10% of the real beach. And when the, um, and this is exactly what happened at North Sea Harbor, uh, North Sea Beach Colony was that the offshore profile became steepened and uh, the steeper the profile uh, allows bigger waves to, to reach the beach. And that's all based on sand supply. And so rebuilding that offshore profile takes huge volumes of sand. As which is fortunately what we were able to do in North Sea Harbor, um, but yeah, I, I I I haven't done the research, but my suspicion is you will see an oversteepened foreshore. It does it does cause some angst for me to wonder what it would take to provide stability on this beach if we continue to have a steeper offshore uh, erosion. It sounds to me like you can put some armoring on the beach or some, uh, some, some more cobble, but if that erosion happens offshore and the waves keep getting uh, deeper, the beach, the, the water gets deeper and the waves gets bigger, there gets to be a point where you just can't do it this way. Yeah, I, you know, when, uh... I agree that that is, um, is something that is worthy of investigation. Um, uh, I have spoken um, several times with the um, Bayview Oaks uh, Property Owners Association uh, to uh, see if there was an interest in you know, moving forward with a more macro project. Uh, but at the present time, there doesn't appear to be, but you know, it's like, uh, what do they say? Nothing focuses your attention like the hangman's noose. You know, another storm comes and maybe they'll decide that they do want to focus on that. Because I think it, it's going to take a regional effort to address the issues that you're bringing up. On this property, I think what we're offering the board right now um, fits from um, engineering, it fits from geology, it fits from uh, environmental, and it fits from a policy point of view. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm actually awaiting Marty's reply to uh, your comments, and uh, you may very well be right. Um, but my thinking is, once again, without having full analysis, is that uh, this is probably a stopgap measure to get us through a little bit of time before something more severe happens or some much bigger Band-Aid is put on it. So we can adjourn this to a later date. Is there, Charlie, is there anyone in the public like to speak in this application? I'll check. I see no hands. We have four hearings scheduled for the next meeting, November 17th. Two of them are gonna be heard together. So more effectively, we have three. And the following meeting, we have three. We have one, we have three. And the following meeting, we have three. Um, so, and that gets us to the end of December. Um, Aram, um, let's see. We'll have three, then just pick one whenever you're gonna be ready. Well, I, I would uh, I would put forward to the board that you know our situation is pretty serious here, as you can see by what we displayed, and we are, are in possession of our DEC permit. So uh, our our uh, our authorization from this board is is the you know is our critical path, and so uh, the sooner we can be heard, the better. I would say. Okay, Marty, can you give us a sense of time that you need to review this application? Uh, whatever works for the board is uh, fine with me. And whatever works for the uh, applicant as well. Would you be ready by the 17th, Aaron? Yes, I'll be ready. All the meetings have three. We should probably just hear it right away. Uh, yeah, if, if our history is any guide to what's going on next, there'll be one or two of these adjourned anyway. So we probably will have time. Uh, would you like to make a motion for the November 17th? Anybody in the public want to comment yet? There was no comment. 
Nick, oh, yes, that, have, does yeah. Nick have anything else to say? No, thank you. And I think the only person, the other person in the um, public is Pam, my paralegals, and who won't be speaking either. Thank okay. you. Motion to adjourn to November 17th. Second. Second. All in favor, Harry, aye. George? Aye. Anne? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Thank you, all. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night, Aaron. Thank you. Good night. Now, um, we don't have many options left on the first public hearing, except to adjourn it, kick it, kick the, kick the can down the street a bit, um, since they're not here. Uh, so why don't we adjourn that to <clears throat> the first meeting in December, December 8th. Uh, I'll introduce that again, just for the record. A021026, Thomas Conti. And this is not yet discussed, but has been open, and there's no one here to uh, speak on this. So let's adjourn this for another month. And uh, what's the process? Karina, can you uh, send a note indicating, uh, telling the agent? Is that the best way to do it? So they know yeah. there's a... I'm sending an email right now. Okay. All right. To adjourn that meeting to that application till December 8th. December 1st. Right? December, December now. December 1st. December, it says December 8th and the 22nd. Are those the dates of our meetings? No, I thought it was first and third. Well, it usually is. It was only for this month that it was the first and third. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. We have other meetings scheduled for the 8th and the 22nd. So December 8th, it's been moved and is there a second? Second. second. All in favor, Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. The administrative wetland permits are in your, in your packets and Bowser reports for the ZBA, John and Victoria Petrillo. Yeah, um, uh, Marty is a uh, chief environmental analyst. And I'm not sure that the advisory report is in the uh, meeting uh, packet. Um, it's not actually in my packet, but uh, that being said, uh, this is a uh, property in the uh, hamlet of uh, North Sea where the uh, board had um, issued a uh, permit for uh, residential improvements. Uh, there is a uh, pending uh, variance application before the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals as uh, some uh, dimensional uh, setback uh, relief is uh, needed. The uh, survey that was uh, provided to the uh, ZBA uh, is uh, consistent with the uh, project plan that the uh, board uh, has uh, approved. So uh, notwithstanding uh, whether or not you have a uh, copy of the advisory uh, report, uh, there are no significant issues uh, with this uh, variance application. So I think you can uh, vote in uh, favor of uh, forwarding that uh, advisory uh, report that again, simply uh, indicates that the uh, project plans that were uh, submitted to the uh, ZBA are consistent with the uh, board's approval. The advisory comments also indicate that the uh, board had uh, required a uh, covenanted wetland uh, preservation area and uh, actually uh, vegetated. Uh, buffer. Thank you. Motion to send those comments to the ZBA. Second. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Resolution of conditional approval A020049, John J. Sudam and Mary T. Sudam. Any discussion? 
Moved to issue. Second. Resolved that a conditional wetland permit approval granted to John J. Sudam and Mary T. Sudam for the proposed project upon the terms and conditions, of for, conditions uh, set forth therein. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Anne? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. A021079. Barbara Rosenthal. Any discussion? Move to issue. Second. Resolve that a conditional wetland per permit approval be granted to Barbara Rosenthal for the proposed project upon the terms and conditions set forth therein. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Aye. Um? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Uh, preliminary review, secret determination, A019125, the Howell 2012 Family Trust. Uh, this application relates to an existing residentially developed property on uh, Noyak Road in the hamlet of uh, Noyak. Uh, the site is marked by uh, steep uh, wooded uh, bluffs. There is an existing uh, cottage at the uh, base of the bluff uh, alongside a uh, bulkhead. Uh, the application has been uh, filed in order to gain this board's approval to uh, construct a uh, much uh, larger uh, house on the site. Uh, the work involves uh, significant uh, modifications to the existing uh, health side and uh, bluff uh, virtually all the trees and existing uh, natural uh, vegetation would be uh, removed. There is a uh, preliminary advisory report uh, dated November 3rd, uh, 2021. Um, I am recommending that a public hearing be held as significant additional information is needed in order to make a determination. Motion to schedule a public hearing for December 22nd. 21. Second. Resolve that the Town Conservation Board hereby schedules a public hearing for December 22nd, 2021, and the notice of public hearing be published in the town designated to a person to chapter 325, section 325 DH8C of the town code. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. A021015172 MP Road LLC. Uh, this uh, application relates to an existing uh, residentially uh, developed property that is uh, frontage on uh, Mill Pond in Watermill. It contains uh, state and town uh, regulated uh, fresh water wetlands. Um, the uh, landowner had uh, commenced uh, residential uh, improvements at the site without requisite uh, town wetland and building uh, permits, uh, despite a notice violation and stop work order and communications with the landowner. Um, he uh, proceeded with work and has uh, completed the improvements. There is a uh, preliminary advisory report on file dated uh, November uh, 1. 2021. Um, what uh, you're seeing before you is a sketch I prepared uh, recommending um, a uh, covenanted uh, buffer, which uh, the applicant has generally agreed to. At the uh, same time, we're still waiting on an asphalt uh, survey showing the extent of uh, improvements at the site. So we uh, do need uh, significant additional information uh, in order to make a determination. As such, I'm recommending that a public hearing be held. Motion to schedule a public hearing for December 22, 2021. Second. Resolved that the Town Conservation Board here by <laughs> 2nd, 2021, and then a notice of public hearing be published in the town designated to say person to chapter 325, section 325 DH8C of the town code. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. Ann? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. And 
there was a modification. I think that was pulled off. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, they have. Although I uh, met with the uh, landowner last week and addressed all the uh, issues, um, they had uh, hoped to get their modification application uh, in on Friday. Then they hoped to get it in on uh, Monday. And while we uh, drafted the uh, requisite application, we have not a uh, requisite uh, resolution. We have not yet uh, received the uh, application. So we'll have to uh, bounce that modification to the uh, next meeting. Okay. And for the benefit of the rest of the board members, I did speak to Karina today about a hyperlink. Um, what, uh, did you make any progress on that, Karina? Yes, I met with Tara. I mean, I'm going to meet with her on Friday and she's gonna show me how to add the hyperlink to- Okay. What I'm trying to accomplish is this. There are so many times when I'm going through the agenda uh, and I, I really wanna see Marty's report and I have it somewhere. The hyperlink would ease that just click on that and bingo, we got Marty's report right in front of us. So we're working on, Karina's gonna work on trying to put that on uh, when she emails the agenda to us to be right next to say the public hearing. So it can be right at our fingertips. Yes. So, Harry, would we be able to see surveys the same way? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I can add the surveys also. Great. Beautiful. Great. And then uh, we'll uh, also uh, add any uh, sketches that I've uh, prepared uh, showing recommended buffers and such and project modifications. Great. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Harry, aye. George? Aye. And? Aye. Tom? Aye. Jerry? Aye. Thank you all.